In verse 5, obviously uh, yesterday was a, uh, one of those moments in our nation that uh, you have to acknowledge in a lot of different ways, and we're going to acknowledge it this morning in prayer. And so I would like to take the opportunity to lead us in prayer right now for our nation, for the people that uh, were hurt yesterday and killed. And uh, just take that opportunity. You guys willing to do that with me? Amen? All right, let's pray together. Lord, as we come before you today, we hold our nation, the families that lost loved ones yesterday, that were injured, our former president, Trump, in this assassination attempt, we, we ask you to hold them in your loving hands. Just as Psalm 23 that we just read, Lord, reminds us that you are our shepherd, we ask that you guide and protect our nation. Lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake, so that we may glorify you in all that we do. Lord, in the midst of evil, we trust your provision and grace. You are the God of abundance, you are the God of restoration, and we pray for healing to reign in our land. And we know that true healing only happens through Christ. May your goodness and mercy follow us as we serve you and share your name all the days of our lives. As we go forth, Father, as we just sang, Lead us daily in the fight against the darkness, the powers of evil, that all the world may see your glory and your name be lifted high. Lord, we thank you for being our refuge and our strength, truly our shepherd who cares for us deeply Help us to trust in your sovereignty and to seek your wisdom in all decisions that affect our nation and our homes. And Lord, may your peace, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians 16 We're looking this morning in verses 5 through 12. And as I looked at these verses this week again, I I look at what the Apostle Paul shares, and I'm led in my mind back into church history to a a missionary, a, a great missionary. Now, I may have mentioned this before, but as... Our kids were growing up, we read through the series of little missionary books with them. And I am so thankful that we did that because I think I learned more than they did. It, they were really amazing. And one of those great missionaries was Hudson Taylor. You see, Hudson Taylor had a vision, had a heart for the inland regions of China, and and he was known to say this quote that many people use, God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. Have any of you heard that before? It's kind of his, his famous quote. Well, let me give you the context for that. He was a trailblazer, really, in what was known as the great century of missions for the church, the 19th century, leading a missionary thrust into the inland regions of China. He had first landed in Shanghai, in China, on March 1st in 1854. A little different than flying in and saying, hey, I'm going to be a missionary. His first missionary tour, he stayed along with the other missionaries there in that port city, and the other missionaries were kind of hugging along the coast at that point in the mid-19th century, and he realized that as he traveled around, there were vast inland regions. 
millions of Chinese people that had never heard the gospel, had no opportunity to hear the gospel. And I want you to hang on that word opportunity this morning. And he had a heart for this, and it was a vast undertaking, and he knew that he needed both people and resources. He knew he needed both people, and let's redefine resources to what we know, what it really means, money. He needed people and money, and those resources had to be partnered together and linked together that God would raise up qualified individuals and raise up funds to support them at the same time. And as he thought about all the people and then all of the money that it would take to support them, he was led back to consider God's ways with the Israelites. And he wrote a letter to his friend saying this. Here's another quote that I think you can hang your hat on in life. Our heavenly father is a very experienced one. Do you get it? Our heavenly father is a very experienced heavenly father. God is experienced. He knows very well that his children wake up with an appetite every morning. And what did he do? He sustained millions of Israelites in the wilderness for 40 years. And so when he was thinking of that, he wrote this letter to his friend saying God's work, obviously thinking of the Israelites, thinking of that journey for 40 years, God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supplies. And that's the context of that famous statement. And so a missionary society was founded, the China China Inland Mission ultimately responsible for bringing more than 800 missionaries to China, began 125 Christian schools that directly resulted in 18,000 Chinese people making a profession of faith at that time, 300 worker stations. Now, what did Hudson Taylor mean then again? When he said God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply, we have to take it apart. What is God's work? And what is God's way to do that work? And that's actually what's in front of us in the scripture here. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. The wisdom The wisdom of God is a matter of choosing not only the proper destination, but the best way to get to that destination. God's wisdom is not random. God's wisdom is meticulous. He knows where we're heading, everyone. He's a wise king. He's also chosen the best way to get there. The ultimate destination of human history is is to be with him and to give glory to him in the process of getting there. That's God's great glory put on display in this wise and loving and powerful and gracious way that he is dealing with sinful human beings. The greatest display of the glory of God is the salvation of sinners. Amen? By the saving work of Jesus Christ, by his death on the cross, and by his resurrection victory over death in the grave, and then the proclamation of that simple gospel message to save sinners from every tribe and every language and every people and every nation, that is God's work. And that is what Paul calls here in this text, the Lord's work, starting in verse 5. But I will come to you after I go through Macedonia, for I am only going through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may send me on my way wherever I may go. For I do not wish to see you now just in passing, for I hope to remain with you for some time if the Lord permits." But I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Now if Timothy comes, take care that he is with you without fear, for he is doing the Lord's work as I also am. So let no one despise him. 
but send him on his way in peace so that he may come to me, for I expect him with the brothers. Now concerning Apollos, our brother, I encouraged him greatly to come to you with the brothers, and it was not at all his desire to come now. But he will come when he has the opportunity. First thing we see here in this text is embracing God's timing. Embracing God's timing. Paul was at Ephesus when he wrote this letter, and when you look at verses 5 through 7, his plan was to travel to Macedonia for a time of ministry, pass through what that means is travel in a systematic ministry there in verse 5, winter at Corinth, and then go to Judah with a collection. From November to February, it was impossible to travel that area by ship, so it would have been convenient for Paul to stay in Corinth and be with his friends. There were some problems to solve in the church, as we had known, and Paul had promised to come and help the leaders. However, various circumstances forced Paul to revise the plans at least twice. Plan B was to visit Corinth then, then travel through Macedonia, passing through Corinth the second time on his way to Judah. You can see that in 2 Corinthians 1, 15 and 16. Instead of one long visit, he planned two shorter visits, but even this plan did not materialize. Then there was plan C. Turned out to be a quick and painful visit to Corinth, after which he returned to Ephesus. He then went to Troas to wait for Titus, who had been sent to Corinth, visited Macedonia, then traveled to Judah. He did not spend as much time in Corinth as he had hoped or as they had expected. There's a lot of different plans there. And what can we learn from this experience of Paul's? Well, for one thing, as a Christian, we must use common sense. Pray. We must study the situation, seek the best that we can in information to determine the will of God. Now, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 states within it, lean not on your own understanding. And I've heard so many people butcher those verses into this thought of put your brain in neutral and don't think. That is not what is meant there. God gives us our mind and he expects us to think, but he does not want us to depend on our own reasoning. Do not depend on your own reasoning. Pray, meditate on the word, and even seek the counsel of other mature Christian friends. Iron sharpens iron. So we see that first. We also understand here, too, our decisions. Guess what, everyone? I don't know if you've ever had this happen to you. Our decisions may not always be in the will of God. If you've ever had that happen, we may make promises that we cannot keep, plans that we cannot fulfill. And does that mean that you are a liar? Does that mean that you're a failure? Well, actually, what's interesting is some of the believers in Corinth thought that of Paul. If you go over to 2 Corinthians 1, verses 12, uh, and chapter 2, verse 13, that section, some of them thought Paul was deceptive and not to be trusted. I will tell you, in 30-plus years of ministry, I've had to change my plans every once in a while. I've had to alter my schedule because of situations that I didn't have any control over. Does this mean I've been out of the will of God and making plans? No, not necessarily. I love the fact that I can look at Paul and go, here's an apostle that had to change his calendar. That's refreshing to me. That lets me know that, you know what, eventually... We'll figure it out. We'll figure out God's will. We'll figure out God's way. We'll figure out God's planning. But what we need to make sure is we don't hit the extremes on everything. We must avoid, in this manner of seeking God's will, we must avoid being so frightened 
at making some sort of mistake that we make no decisions at all. We, we cannot be like that. And the other side of it is that we, we cannot make impulsive decisions and rush ahead and blame it on God. There's a statement, wait upon the Lord, His timing. You see, after we've done all that we can to determine the leading of the Lord, we must decide and we must act and we leave the rest in the Lord's hands. And that's what we see here. Uh, if there's some way that we're out of His will, He will so work that we will finally have His guidance and we will be put back on the right path. The important thing is that we sincerely want to do the will of the Lord. We've been all over Psalm 23 today. You know and what I love to... I, I, you guys may think that we're so well coordinated around here that if you know us well enough, you know we're not. Um, I had no idea that Daniel was going down the road of Psalm 23 for communion. And when we had talked about you know, doing a prayer for our nation and everything, I had already pulled out a little part of Psalm 23, and he's, he's like, well, yeah, I'm actually using that for communion. And I'm like, hmm, must be God's will that we camp out in Psalm 23 a little bit today because I also had planned that right here. The important thing is that we want to do His will, and after all, we need to remember in Psalm 23, 3, where it says He guides us. For his name's sake. You, you realize at the end of the day, we as believers, it's his reputation that's at stake when we go out and say that we believe in him. We are his ambassadors. And so we need to make sure that we embrace God's timing. We need to also make sure to look at the opportunities then in God's timing. I told you to hang on to that word opportunity. Verse 8 and 9, But I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Now, I, I think that's interesting. How in the world, Paul, is there a wide and effective door of ministry when there's many adversaries? That doesn't make sense. Usually you're like, a wide and effective door would mean there's no adversaries. Woohoo! No one's against us. Here we go. But it is well known within the history of the church, whenever the church is highly persecuted, you know what happens? The church is highly effective. A wide and effective door has opened to me. Paul had an open door of ministry in Ephesus, and this was important to him. He wanted to win the lost in Ephesus. And what I love about Paul is that Paul was neither an optimist nor a pessimist. He was a realist. He saw both the opportunities and the obstacles in those verses, right? A wide and effective door, but many adversaries. He's being very real. God had opened a great door for effective work, and Paul was going to seize on the opportunity while they were still there. There's an ancient Roman proverb that says this, while we stop to think, we often miss our opportunity. Once we know what to do, you do it. You don't delay. You can think. Man, I'm, I'm the chief of all thinkers sometimes. You know, you have the chief of all sinners. Yeah, we all have that. But are you also like me where every once in a while you can figure out all of the reasons not to act? Man, I've got them all down. Every situation, I can figure out all of the reasons why I shouldn't do anything. Even though Paul was in danger in Ephesus, he planned to remain there while the door was open. It's, it, and it has a picture here in the language of being a wise merchant, actually. He had to buy up the opportunity. 
a wide and effective door. The language also means they're buying up the opportunity before it vanished and would never return. The stewardship of opportunity is important. The individual believer, the church family, must constantly ask, what opportunities is God giving us today? Instead of complaining about obstacles, we must take the advantage of the opportunities and we leave the results to the Lord. And to the letters, to the, in the, Paul wrote the letter to Ephesians, so the very church, the very region that we're talking about, he wrote to them in Ephesians 5, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. And what is wise? Making the most of every opportunity. Because the days are evil. Well, we saw it again yesterday. Are the days evil? They are. We can pick every minute of the day different news stories around the world that prove that fact. But we also, as believers, must understand that the days are also full of opportunity. Colossians 4, 5. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. I was in a hotel recently watching a gentleman go to every person that he came to in the hotel and sharing a little gospel track with them. Making the most of every opportunity. Does he know if those people accept the Lord? Not now. He will later. But I call that making the most of every opportunity. We also need to accept God's will and His timing. Verse 10, Now if Timothy comes, take care that he is with you without fear, for he is doing the Lord's work as I also am. So let no one despise him, but send him on his way in peace so that he may come to me, for I expect him with the brothers. And concerning Apollos, our brother, I encouraged him greatly to come to you with the brothers And it was not at all his desire to come now. I I love the honesty in this. He said, no way, dude. It was not at all his desire to come now, but he will come when? When he has the opportunity. We see Paul instructing the church in Corinth regarding the arrivals of Timothy and Apollos at some point. And Paul's Words convey really a deeper meaning about trusting in God's timing and following His will obediently. Timothy, a faithful servant of the Lord, which we've been spending time in the letters to Timothy on Thursday night, he was expected to visit the church in Corinth. And Paul reassures them not to fear, but to welcome him with peace, respect, acknowledging the work that Timothy is involved in for the Lord. And Timothy was part of Paul's team. And this reminds us that God sends his messengers at the appointed time to fill his purposes. And you know what we're supposed to do? We accept God's people God's messengers, we receive them with open hearts, without fear, without prejudice. And on the other hand here, we see Apollos, another brother in Christ, who was like, eh, not this time, not right now, wasn't eager to do it. Even with Paul's encouragement, Apollos chose to wait for the opportune time determined by God. This also teaches us the virtue of patience and the obedience in God's timing. Sometimes we may not desire things immediately, but God's timing is perfect. He knows what is best for us. And as believers, we are called to trust in the Lord's sovereignty, surrender our plans to His divine will, just as Timothy and Apollos followed God's timing in their ministry. I think it's interesting 
Now, Apollos, we know in Scripture that Apollos was not a part of Paul's missionary team. You know, he was, it was a separate ministry. Obviously, there are brothers in Christ, and there are points where they've crossed paths. You know, some were for me, some were from Apollos. Some, so you, you see those times there. And what, what I find interesting when you, when you dig into the Scripture and the language there, he doesn't really swing a bat at Apollos. He's like, yeah, you know, I tried to encourage him, and he said no right now. But then he ends it with, but he will come when he has opportunity. So he actually ends it with a positive. He says, I don't know if he, he doesn't say, I don't know if he's going to come. He doesn't say, I don't think he's following God's will. You notice all of those things? He doesn't say any of that. What does he say? He will come when he has opportunity. Paul is acknowledging that even though what he would have liked Apollos to do at that time was not the right time. I, I, I think that's big for both of them. How easy would it be for Apollos to listen to Paul and say, hey, whatever you do, whatever, whatever you want me to do, I'll drop everything and do it right now without thinking about, is this God's will for what he wants me to do right now? And he obviously thought about it. And he said, not right now, but when I have the opportunity, I will. So there was obviously ministry going on that he felt like God had not released him from. The virtue of patience, the virtue of obedience in God's timing. Man, I, how many times have you wanted something to happen in your life and you've wanted it to happen immediately? But we do need to remember that God's timing is perfect and He knows what is best for us. He is sovereign. We surrender our plans to Him. We follow God's timing in our lives, just like Timothy and Apollos followed in their ministry. We seek guidance. We wait upon Him in faith and practice. We should not be anxious or discouraged when things do not happen according to our timetable but we submit to the greater plan. And what is that plan? God's plan. 1 Peter 5, verse 6, Therefore, humble yourselves under what? The mighty hand of God. That He may exalt you when? At the proper time. Casting what? All of your anxiety on him, remembering what? Because he cares for you. Because of all of that, Peter writes, be of sober spirit. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in the faith knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished among your brethren who are in the world. And after you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, how much grace? All grace. The God of all grace who called you to His eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, strengthen, confirm, and ground you. Now you need to take 1 Peter 5, 6 through 10 and slap it on your calendar. The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself He's not going to send just Bob. Himself. Restore, strengthen, confirm, and ground you. How many of you today feel like you need to be restored? How many of you today feel like you need some more strength? 
How many of you today feel like, man, it'd be really nice if God confirmed where I'm at in life? How many of you would feel a little bit better to be more grounded in him? And what Peter is saying here is, guess what, everyone? He's going to do it. Live in that hope, in the faith of that happening. Yes, you're going to suffer for a little while, but he's going to do it. He is going to do it. Accepting God's will in his timing requires faith and obedience and patience. We need to be like Timothy. We need to be like Apollos. We need to be like Paul. Willing and faithful to follow God's lead, even when it may not align with what you immediately think should be your life right now. Trust in His perfect timing. Confidently walk in the path that He has set before us. I may walk in a path that's dark and evil, but He is my shepherd and He is going to guide me and give me strength and lead me to His glory. And so we need to be committed to God's work. And you look around yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus says it's, it's going to be a battle. It is an ultimate battle between evil and Satan and the perfect love of God. We've got to be committed to the work that's at hand. Paul was dedicated to spreading the gospel. We need to emphasize the importance of that in our own lives and think about how can I be involved in serving God, supporting ministries that spread His Word, being a person that has got enough guts to share truth. We need to be a team. Did you catch that there's a team going on here? In this little section, hey, when Timothy comes, great. And the brothers are going to go with him, which implies there's a team. The value of teamwork is huge. And Paul sought the church's support in his mission, showing that we also should not work alone, but rely on support of fellow believers in spreading the gospel. We are his team here at West Hills. If you've been on leadership with me for any time, you've heard me say from time to time, remain flexible and patient, which is really more preaching at me. But we need to be flexible and obedient. Be flexible and obedient to God's leading. Paul was willing to change plans according to God's will. So we need to be open to God's direction even when it may be different from what our original plans were. We need to pray, pray, pray. Pray for guidance. Constant communication in God through prayer and reading of His Word, seeking His guidance in all aspects of our lives. Paul's reliance on prayer and seeking God's will serves as a model for us to follow. And then encouragement, everyone. Encouragement and support. Just as the Corinthian church supported Paul, we are called to uplift and assist those who are spreading the gospel. There's a reason why we've made some shifts even up front in our prayer times and things like that where we're, we're praying for other churches around us, like-minded churches, because you know what? We're a team together. We're in this thing together. We're working together to reach the lost. We're spreading the gospel. We need to trust in God's provision. God is faithful. Amen? 
We need to be mission-minded in how we live. We need to see every interaction, every interaction, let me say it one more time, every interaction as an opportunity, as an ordained chance, which of course means that it wasn't by chance, an ordained opportunity to share God's love, impact others for Christ, We need to do all of that in serving Him. Will you join me, brothers and sisters here at West Hills, in being faithful in following God's timing and being faithful to walk through the open doors of ministry, of opportunity that He gives all of us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.